elected to public office. And uh, Christelle thought I was calling for her. What's funny is the way the studio is set up is if you don't bang on something, then there's no way for the person in the other room who's watching to tell. Um, okay, I smoke weed. Well, Sam, you wanted to run for fill in the blank. I am going to run for something someday. I'm either going to win or lose. And I've always said the same thing. When I'm working for you, the taxpayer, I will obey all of the laws that I have to ex obey while doing so. I work for me right now. The government cannot tell me whether or not I can smoke weed or not. If they think they can, they can go to hell. Should I just say that on air? Yes, I said it on air because I'm not working for the for you, the taxpayer, right now. And that's how I've always said it. And if you think, well, I'm not going to vote for you. You just admitted you smoked weed. Yeah, I smoke weed. Guess what? Barack Obama admitted he smoked coke and you voted for him, you freaking moron. Friends, you're listening to The Correct View. Sam I. B. DeGangie reporting for TheMediaSpeaks.com. I told you I was going to be real. I told you I was going to bring it today. Well, I'm going to be even more real. If people don't help you with your show, you don't have a show. So what you try to do is you try to pick sponsors that you believe in so that you never have to push anything that you don't believe in. Well, I believe in StickerJunkie.com. Let me tell you want to know Why? Because D-Lake's my friend? No, D-Lake is my friend. That doesn't mean he knows how to make a damn sticker. Well, it's because he owns Sticker Junkie. Well, yeah, that might be it. Because if you own Sticker Junkie, you you know Sticker Junkie make the best stickers. How good? Look at these stickers. He made these for our band. I designed the logo, and he did all the rest. Well, this is actually one from our movie. Look at these. Go to uh, youtube.com slash passing time band. D Lake made those stickers from a design that I gave him like a ballpark and I said have fun with. If you think they look good, go to stickerjunkie.com and make sure you tell them when you make put your order in, leave a comment, make sure they know you heard about it from the correct views. And you're going to get quite a discount. This, friends, is brought to you by Mike McLaughlin. Go to Facebook.com, uh, Mike, M-A-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. He is a writer of fiction. He is a writer of political commentary. He is a poet. He is somebody who you want to look up, and I'm proud to have Sticker Junkie and Mike McLaughlin as a sponsor of this show. I've got the best sticker maker in the country and one of the best writers in the country as a sponsor of the show. I would say we're doing okay. You want to sponsor the show? Correct views at hotmail.com. I'll promote you too, but you got to be something I believe in. I'm not going to do it otherwise. Friends at dailymail.co.uk. Will a volcanic eruption destroy humanity? Scientists warn that the world must begin preparing for an explosive global catastrophe. There are some Russian scums who have uh, said that you could bomb Yellowstone and trigger this. Uh, it's, it's fake science, by the way. It can't happen. We'll never say can't. Very unlikely. This is different. This here is um, it happening not based on man. This is very worrisome. If you don't want to hear about this, then scan ahead. I got the dumb the other day. I got NASA. I got a veteran being harassed. For those of you that actually want to grow your brain power, I know you want to hear uh, libertarian good, Democrat bad, kill Hillary, kill Hillary. You know what? Her career, not her. Sometimes it's time to go outside your comfort zone and learn some other things. You don't want to be a one-trick pony. Here you go. The world is woefully unprepared for a massive volcanic eruption that could kill millions of people and destroy much of modern society, a leading group of scientists has warned. And again, the only thing that these scientists are saying is that with a 10% chance of this happening, shouldn't we at least be a little bit more prepared than we are? That's not a fanatical question to me. That seems to me to be a rather fair-minded, logical question. In a new report on the risks posed by natural disasters, experts at the European Science Foundation concluded that a large volcanic eruption posed the greatest risk to human survival. Again, yum, in the likelihood you've only got a one in three chance of getting cancer, so, you know, two-thirds of the time you won't. 
doesn't it seem that you should maybe take some vitamin C, 3,000 milligrams a day, by the way, echinacea, and maybe you should get some calcium in your bones to prevent estrontium buildup from Fukushima. Doesn't that seem to be in a wise direction that you would want to take? Well, doesn't it seem to you that you would want to be prepared in case one of these earthquakes were to happen? It says, in a new report on the risk posed by natural disasters, experts at the European Science Foundation concluded that large volcanic eruptions pose the greatest risk to human survival. They calculated that there is between a 5 to 10% probability that an explosive eruption large enough to cause huge numbers of death after the climate and poison the atmosphere occurring by the end of just this century. Such an eruption <coughs> would be similar to the size of the explosion of Tambora on Sambua, Indonesia, in 1815, which killed 100,000 people. There is between a 5 and 10% chance, which isn't the majority for you Usher fans, that 100,000 people could die. When you're dealing with those kind of numbers that are so high, with at least an arguable number like 10%, it might be wise to use the thinking part of your brain and pay attention here. The ash cloud thrown out from this eruption reached more than 26 miles into the atmosphere and triggered at temperature changes that led to widespread famine and epidemics. A lot of you don't know that it wasn't the meteor that hit the planet that stopped the dinosaurs from being able to live. It was the meteor hitting the planet and the plume of dirt and debris and earth that blocked out the sun and once the planet turned it moved it over the whole planet that cooled the planet by many many degrees and led to the death of dinosaurs well guess what that could happen to us and not just by meteors but by volcanic eruptions and a lot of the death, not all the death, most people, guess what? You're still screwed. I ain't going to lie to you. You're still screwed. Many people, however, could be saved by being a little bit more prepared than we are. It says the summer following the Tambora eruption is known as the year without summer. The scientists warn, however, that rising population levels, by the way, if you don't have summer, you can't grow food. You starve to death the next year. An increasing reliance on global travel could mean the impacts of a similar eruption could be far more severe. Writing in their report, there's a link, extreme geohazards, reducing the disaster risk and increasing resilience. The experts warn that there needs to be an international response to prepare for such a disaster and to monitor similar events. They estimate that it could cost between uh, 340, oh, uh, let me, who cares what the euro is, $500 million and $3.5 billion a year to increase the level of monitoring for catastrophic volcano eruptions, but the benefits that an early warning could give would, would lead to tens of thousands of times greater. In other words, is your life worth $500 million or $3.5 billion, the life of your kids, the life of your loved ones, the life of the person that you're going to go to sleep with beside the night? I know for some of you, you don't really care about the person that you're going to sleep with beside the night. You're going to leave. You don't really care about them anyway. But for those of you that do, you know what? We could save a lot of lives by being just a little bit more prepared. And again, we can't save all of you. If this goes off, a lot of you are doomed. It says the report states that although in the last few decades earthquakes have been the main cause of fatalities and damage, the main global risk is large volcanic eruptions that are less frequent but far more impactful than the largest earthquakes due to their far-reaching effects on climate, food security, transportation, and supply chains. And these events have the potential to trigger global disaster and catastrophe. And the cost of response and the ability to respond to these events is beyond the financial and political capabilities of any individual country. In other words, no one country, even America, printing money could pay for it. 
An international global political response will be required where science has a unique and the key role is preparation, response, and mitigation. In other words, the UN is wrong to focus on what they're focusing on now, which is ISIS. The report, which was presented, not really, at the General Assembly of the European Geosciences Union Vienna on Tuesday, examines the main geohazards facing the world, including earthquakes, drought, asteroids, strikes, floods, tsunamis, hurricanes, avalanches, and that we're big on that one, and wildfires. In other words, they're trying to say that there needs to be more time, more effort, and more money spent on something that could really, really wipe all of us out. And that would be an explosion of one of these mega volcanoes. Go to the dailymail.co.uk and look up volcano for more on that. The show has already gone long. But I think I've proved my point here. The money is not being spent in the direction that it needs to be spent in. And obviously, I'm not a geoscientist, but hopefully this has inspired you to look up the work of people that are before you call me a nutcase. Because friends, I wouldn't have giving you the news if I didn't think it matters. Uh, CA.news.yahoo NASA probe nearing close encounter with unexplored Pluto. Man, I don't really care about the science. Well, we got gun news, we got veteran news, we got cancer news, we got a whole lot of stuff coming up. But a lot of you like the science stuff. I'm getting a lot of emails on it. And if you just let your mind grow beyond the latest Kesha song for just 10 minutes, I think you'll really like this. So please listen. The first spacecraft to visit distant Pluto. Remember that? My, my very educated mother just served us nine pizza pies. I remember that. It meant the order of the planets. Pluto was last pizza pies. It was last and uh, it was truncated to that of a dwarf planet, which many of us in the scientific community have disagreed with. Mainly because we knew about Pluto in the days of the Aztecs. Um, this is very interesting, and I think you're going to want to hear it. It says, uh, again, the first spacecraft to visit distant Pluto, a dwarf planet in the solar system's frozen backyard, is still three months away from a close encounter, but already is viewing range and newly released photo show. The New Horizons probe blasted off from Florida in January of 06 for a three billion mile journey to the Kuiper Belt region of the solar system located beyond Neptune. Now, how many of you in 2006 were like, Man, I don't care about 2015, man. That's a waste of money. Well, guess what? It's 2015, and we did exactly what that money said we were going to do. We're about to see Pluto, friends. And that's your tax dollars well spent, in my opinion. It says, uh, during that time, Pluto, once known as the ninth planet, as it should still be, in the solar system, was demoted to a dwarf planet, which it should not have been, after the discovery of similar icy bodies in eccentric distant orbits around the sun. Now, those have very little to do with Pluto. It's only based on size, and it was a mistake. Why? Because I told you it was, among other reasons. New Horizons will pass about 7,750 miles from Pluto's surfaces on July the 14th with a diameter of 1,430 miles, roughly two-thirds the size of Earth's moon, which we knew about in ancient days. Look it up. Pluto still looks like a bright dot in color, but images released by NASA on Thursday. For now, the pictures have more value to engineers than scientists. They are serving as a roadmap for control teams to tweak New Horizons approach. The spacecraft does not have to fuel for a barking burn, a, excuse me, a breaking burn to put itself into orbit around Pluto. Rather, like the Voyager explorations in the late 70s and 80s, the New Horizons will make its observations on the fly. Quote, our teams has that's where it's written our teams has worked go figure to get to this point and we know we have just one shot to make this work alice bauman new horizons missions operating uh, operations manager at the 
John Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab said in a statement. Quote, we've plotted out each step of the Pluto encounter, practiced, practiced it over and over, and we're excited about the real deal because it's finally here. After close-up studies of Pluto, its primary moon, Sharon, and an entourage of at least four smaller moons, New Horizons will continue speeding out into the Kuiper Belt, a region peppered with what are believed to be frozen remnants from the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. The team plans, it says, to petition NASA for additional funds for a flyby for a second Kuiper Belt object in 2019. I think it should be done immediately, by the way. And supported fully, happily. It's the last paragraph here. In addition to its cameras, the spacecraft is outfitted with six scientific instruments, including light splitting spectrometers and plasma and dust detectors study the geology of Pluto and Sharon, map their surface compositions and temperatures, and look for an atmosphere, ring system, and other moons. I'm very excited about it. Friends, and that brings us on to this. This was really interesting. Cancer drug company accused of hiding cheap alternative. Albuterol, one of the oldest asthma medicines, typically costs $50 to $100 per inhaler in the U.S., but it was less than $15 a decade ago before it was repat repatented. Christina Syrich Infowars, what's bothersome about this is that these laws were put in place to protect those who patented something important. And unfortunately, what it's done has led to more problems than the patent system had ever been made to protect. It says pharmaceutical companies have been known to discredit natural and cheap solutions that compete with the high dollar drugs. Now, the British Medical Journal has unraveled new research, there's a link for it, revealing how the makers of a cancer drug are blocking public access to a cheaper, safe, and effective alternative. The BMJ explains that Novartis, a company which markets a licensed cancer drug as Lucentis, which is used for macular degeneration, tried to derail research on another treatment called Avatizin. And look it up. A-V-A-S-T-I-N is a link in the article, if you don't believe me. Novartis denies the claim, another link, which they have the market cornered because they sell the only officially licensed drug in the UK. God save the Queen. Many doctors use Avastin as a cheaper but unlicensed alternative to treat wet age related macular degeneration, which is known as AMD. It affects 26. 20, 26,000 people plus in the UK annually. Approximately 11 million in the US have been diagnosed with some sort of macular degeneration. With that number expected to double by 2050, that's not that far away, scientifically speaking. It goes on, Lucentis costs the NHS around uh, 740 euros per dose, that's like 1,100 US dollars. Avastin, on the other hand, they cost around 50 to 65 euros per dose, as opposed to 740, sounds like a deal. It says doctors still prescribe it, though it hasn't been authorized to be used for macular degeneration. In other words, the cheaper drug isn't allowed to be used because there are patents which make the more expensive drug better, even though it works at least as well uh, at worst, it works inferior. The better drug in many instances is Avastin, and that is why patents and copyrights and all of that lead in a very bad direction. It leads to people dying of cancer that shouldn't. Who? Well, like I just said, about 26,000 people have to depend on this research. And that would matter to you if your loved one was one of them. God forbid if it was you. ABCActionNews.com brings us to the dum de dum de dum de of the day. Veteran says that he was repeatedly put on hold by the Veteran Suicide Hotline. 
there have been jokes about suicide hotlines putting people on hold since I was a child. Christelle, if you ever need to call a suicide hotline, what would you expect? Them to actually talk to you? And try to talk you out of it? Would you expect to be put on hold? No, that would make me commit suicide. He put himself in danger, it says, to protect our country, but when he needed help to save his own life, all he got was a recorded message. Ted Koran was thinking about committing suicide Saturday night. He reached out to the VA and Veteran Suicide Hotline for help, but said he couldn't get any help until after he was reportedly and repeatedly put on hold for up to 10 minutes at a time. Miss Christelle, I think I might have messed up. This is a this is one that maybe should have been in the uh, the dunce cap of the month. His case is just the latest I team that has been exposing for months now. When the Veterans Crisis Hotline was first set up in the VA in 07, it averaged 60 calls a day on four manned phone lines. Now. 52 operators at a time filled about a thousand calls a day. Can, Christelle, can 52 people take care of a thousand bad calls a day? No. Well, it says it can. And now it says it's not always even enough to keep some veteran on the verge of suicide from being placed on hold. My wife and I saved them and they saved me, Tom Coran said. He said the 60 rescue animals he cares for are the only reason that he's even here today. In other words, he's alive because of animals, not because of what the VA did. Late Saturday night, he had an emotional breakdown. I was missing my wife, he said. Karan's wife, Karen, died of cancer six months ago, and he was so depressed that he considered ending it all. That may have been maybe because she wasn't allowed to use THC. It says, I went to the only place that I knew that I had available to me, and that was the VA, Curran said. The U.S. Air Force veteran first called the James Haley VA Center, that's where you can call and complain, in Tampa. Where a recording gave him the 800 number to the hotline. Curran said he was placed on hold for up to 10 minutes. He may have been holding a gun in his mouth, for crying out loud. I had to sit there patiently in emotional distress and tears or wanting to give up, desperately needing someone to talk to, Karan said. Karan said he hung up and redialed the number two more times. They, they had me on the verge of saying to hell with it, he said. Karan said he actually reached a counselor. She did very little to even comfort him once she finally talked to him and took him off hold. A Scripps National Investigation recently uncovered that calls to the veterans hotline often overloaded the system, and he had to be rerouted to other call centers while vet calls were placed on hold. In other words, they don't have enough people to help, so they keep passing you around as if the only thing you were calling about was the fact that your internet ran out, not that you're about to blow your head off because of travesties you saw with crazy imams raping women in a war that you were sent to. I swear to God. One veteran recorded being on hold for 36 minutes. He's lucky he still has a head on his shoulders. We're asking for more staff and better technology, the director of the call center told Scripps. I would hope so. More than 1,000 veterans contact the hotline every day. On average, 22 veterans a day commit suicide, or about 65. I one wonder every, why. One every 65 minutes, Christelle. 22 veterans a day, just over one hour a day. That's that's about how long I've been on the show. Somebody blows their head off because of what they saw in the war and there's nobody to help. The very ones that are supposed to be there were the ones that let me down, said Karan. He said he's lucky his rescue animals came to his rescue and he doesn't believe that all veterans will be as lucky. Well, I, I would doubt so. Many won't have that many animals and many won't care about those animals if they do. It says the VA is hoping new technology and more funding from Congress were good luck. We'll allow them to fix all of the problems at the hotline within the next six months. Yeah, Congress will swoop in like the Batman and save you in the next six months. 
Friends, this is bad. That's sort of an I-team investigation. They'll look into whatever you need them to if you contact them. Friends, you're listening to The Court Wrecked Views. Sam I.B. DeGangie signing off. Do me a favor. Go to TheMediaSpeaks.com. Look up the work of Kyle Court like and myself. You will be happy that you did. Also, make sure you go to Change Transportation if you're within a 50 to a, I don't know, 100 miles of Canton, Ohio. Look up the rates they're going to give you based on what your local cab company will give you, and you'll be wanting to roll with a train, change of transportation. Good night, friends, and God bless.